Beyond, and hello everyone. My name is Jonathan Dornbush, and this is Podcast Beyond episode. I gotta look at it because it's been so long since we last recorded an episode, sort of. It's episode 647 uh, of IGN's weekly PlayStation podcast, part two, because boy, oh boy, have we had a day. I'm joined this week by the one and only Lucy O'Brien. Hello. How are you, Jonathan? Uh, what a I'm... morning we've had. What a morning. So, so much so that it's now the afternoon. Um, <laughs> for those who didn't see my tweet, who listen or watch the show, uh, we record an episode with the four of us. The whole cast was back together. Um, I thought it was a great episode. We talked about a bunch of stuff. And unfortunately, due to some technical issues, uh, we lost the episode to but time. The worst, the worst part is that like, it was so much great discussion, so many great jokes. No one's ever going to hear it. Yeah, Lost it's a, to the annals it's, of time. It's such a shame, especially they'll never hear my rendition of holding out for a hero, which I used to open the show. Um, it was pretty great, but I promise I, I would never do it again. As I said during that show, you remember so well. Um, <laughs> one time thing, one time thing. One time, one time only, and no one will ever hear it. But of course, we do have uh, plenty to talk about, so I do want to get to it. Um, I do want to mention at the top of this, this will probably be a shorter episode uh, due to the technical limitations, um, but we do have plenty of Last of Us Part Two to talk about. If you haven't seen already, I confirmed, and we did on IGN as well as my Twitter, that I am playing and going to be reviewing The Last of Us Part Two for IGN. The review embargo is June 12th at 12.01 a.m. Pacific. I am not allowed to say anything else about the game other than I'm playing and reviewing it. Um, we will get into my impressions of the review, of course, on June 12th, so you can look forward to that. But what oh, we can... I'm so jealous. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm just sitting here going, yeah, cool, that's great. And oh, I'm just yeah, so yeah. full of envy. It's chewing me <laughs> up inside. I cannot wait to get my hands on this game. Well, I can't tell you whether or not you should want to not wait or not, but you'll have to wait for my impressions till then. But what we can talk about is, of course, the state of play and the recent sort of Inside the Last of Us uh, videos that have been coming out. Uh, we delayed recording the episode this week, of course, to talk about the state of play. We got roughly a 20-minute deep dive into the sequel. Um, for those who didn't watch um, or did watch during the live stream, uh, this is funny to basically be saying the same stuff we did this morning. Uh, I definitely would recommend going to check out the 4K, like, now uploaded version of the video on YouTube. Like, if you watch the live stream, it just isn't the same quality as watching pretty gorgeous gameplay lot you know on the video as it is in the final upload but what we got was a sort of overview of the mechanics the story the world um a setting the stage by neil Druck Druckmann, the director of the game uh and then a sort of eight minute chunk of gameplay that was following ellie through a whole sort of scenario um since i'm you know not wanting to blur the lines of what i can and can't say but for now lucy i want to start off like give me a sort of overview and then we can get into the nitty-gritty of it how did you feel about the state of play showcase for the last of us i loved it i it was it was definitely the most impressive state of play for me personally so far um just the way it was presented uh by neil uh and you know presented with a great deal of compassion by neil considering the the, the times that we're in which i really appreciated uh and it was you know it was it was a proper sort of like hype uh reveal for me well not so much a reveal obviously you know everyone knows this game exists but like in terms of what they showed in terms of um the info we were given about the world and how you traverse it etc it really felt like i was sort of in the crowd at an at an e3 showcase and for me like that is kind of that is the best i can sort of ask for really from a state of play i thought it was it was it was really, 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 really great. Yeah, I um, that just brought to mind. I forgot to talk about it when we first did this, so glad I'm doing it here. Um, I back when I was in college, I weaseled my way into a few E3s by you know using my school's newspaper, and I got to go to the Sony press conference, I believe, where they did the Last of Us One demo. Um, which was uh, Joel basically going in and out of the apartment building and sneaking around in that brutal showcase. And it ended with, I forget who was demoing it, uh, but they finished it and they were like in a really like power stance holding the controller and just pulling all these moves off. And they like dropped the controller, like Mike dropped it and walked off stage at the final kill. And th this gameplay sequence though, evoked a lot of the same moments of like the, you know, it's a word we overuse a lot or the, the industry does, but like, the visceral nature of this combat like this the sequel really seems to be leaning into the every little moment 
is going to matter. Every moment wants to be evocative, whether it's gruesome or brutal or, you know, by the skin of your teeth, you, you es- teeth, you escape. Every little bit wants to be impactful, which is, you know, ambitious, but seems to be paying off in that demo. Yeah, like, I feel like I'm going to need to go for a massive run and then, like, sink three whiskeys before I start playing <laughs> this game. You know what I mean? I'm going to have to get some sort of energy out of me and sort of be in a very kind of calm headspace in order to play because it does. It's, you know, we've always known that The Last of Us, uh, brutal, unforgiving world, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but, you know, ag- again, I-, I always forget that these are characters that I love you know, and, and I, and there are massive stakes. I do really care about the fates of these characters. I do really care about what happens to them and the journey that they go on. And I think one of the the, the most sort of uh, profound moments for me in this particular uh, demo was when uh, Ellie stabs the, 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 the Vita, the Vita, the, Vita the, the, the woman with the Vita, As we you know said, what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, she will forever be immortalized as the as the <laughs> woman playing Hotline Miami on a PlayStation Vita before she, you know, is the last thing she does before she gets killed. How did um, she die? Playing a Vita. Playing a Vita. Oh, that's yeah. just heartbreaking on so many levels. Um, yeah. I'm sure it's how Greg Miller wants to go out. Uh, so, you know, one of the sort of moments that really reminded me of the the series kind of beating heart, you know, it's, it's, it's humanity, uh, is when... Ellie does stab this woman in the neck and it's it's gross and it's sort of sudden and it's clumsy and the whole tussle is sort of frustrating you know and you can kind of sense Ellie's frustration in that moment um and she sort of says like ah oh, that was dumb like you know something like that like or that was that was really stupid that was really dumb um and it was sort of like yes that that whole thing was dumb it was unnecessary it was like that that woman didn't need to to try and to turn around and try and, and and kill Ellie. Like it was all so unnecessary, and the whole sort of scenario seemed so frustrating. And it was also like the the way she said it, it was kind of like like she was bemused. Like it was slightly like like bleakly funny, you know. And it just again like it just reminded me of Ellie. It was just like this is Ellie. I for, I forgot. Like she yeah. she is she is funny. She is. Um, you know, there, there is so much sort of humanity to her. She's like, despite the fact that she's very much being presented as this, like, uh, she's, much, she's much more, I don't want to say cold-blooded, but I guess there's no other word for it. Like, she's much more, uh, she, she's had to survive a long time in this very unforgiving world. And, like, there's, she's hardened, you know. I yeah. really get that sense. But at the same time, she's still Ellie. And I really just... That little moment really brought that home for me in this in this state of play uh, more than anything. Um, yeah, and it, it just it, reminded me of how devastating this experience is going to be. <laughs> yeah, it's funny thinking back, like seeing this gameplay demo, and e- even going back to the preview that I did last year, and like sinking into the role of Ellie, but you know, revisiting this character that obviously was so endearing, and it is. It speaks volumes, I think, about of what Troy Baker and Ashley Johnson did in that first game and obviously what the script pulled off and everything about that game that brought these characters to life that made them so indelible and makes you care for them despite all of the outright terrible things they do in that game. Like, you know, they're doing it to survive, of course, and the, the whole question of what toes the line of morality is part of the game. But at the end of the day, it's like these are people who are killing quite a bit, but you end up caring for them in such amazing ways because of so many of those small moments that just bring out their humanity and who they are. And, and you know, that is something that someone in Ellie's shoes would say. I think that, like, games have kind of grappled with uh, their characters' more, sort of sense of mortality and, 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 you know, how willing, how sort of, how, how they acknowledge what they're doing. I think, you know, they tried to do it with the Tomb, the, the Tomb Raider reboot to a certain degree of success. I loved what they did with the, the character of Lara Croft, but I didn't necessarily think that having her sort of like, <laughs> you know, every single time she killed someone or like murdered a deer, you know, she was so shaken by it. It, did, it didn't really quite ring. I don't know. It, it, I, I understood what they were going for, but, um, you know, she so quickly switched to a much more... Uh, confident cold-blooded killer that I did it, that the initial vulnerability didn't really ring true to me and of course you know we on the other hand we've got sort of uh you know Nathan Drake who doesn't bat an eye when he's like plowing down uh goons left right and center right but uh I I, I felt that this was a really real reaction to to you know having killed a person 
um, for the how many you know she must have killed at, at this point so many people, but you know it still it still gets that little human moment afterwards. You know, there's yeah. no that she's not gonna she's not ready to like you know whip out a quip. She's you know <laughs> she's not like you know she has, she hasn't got some like Peter uh, the Peter Vita related pun at the ready. You know to like. <laughs> really sort of like i'm a i'm a cool cool cold-blooded action hero like she's oh. still very much like aware of what she's doing and that she's ending lives and i i don't know i'm I maybe reading too much into this no moment, but it was it was really profound for me i just thought of the worst vita quit. all right you could say i want to hear person, it i want to hear it i have to say it now let's hear it guess you won't be near that vita any longer that's Cause really because of, of near the 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 program that was on the PlayStation Vita that no one that, used. That was so dumb. Was, like I know, like like it was like you know, seven people. Like puns, not. puns are like not meant to be. Like they're not really, they're not really, they never really evoke like a kind of like a general like ha 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 like that. But that wasn't even like even on an intellectual level, I found that painful. So well I mean, yeah, that's, thank you. Yeah. That's I, what I like to go for when I think of a pun <laughs> is how painful can it be? Um, but no, I do. Uh, speaking of the pain, I do. Wait, 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 wait. I've got a yes. better one. Hasta la vida, baby. <sighs> and it's at least a double because it's both a, a pun and a reference. It, yeah, I, I like it. Um, moving on from our painful puns to uh, the pain of The Last of Us Part II's gameplay, I do want to talk about, because this was stuff I saw a lot in the preview last year, mm-hmm. but uh, they dive into, and this is, I, I guess for you and a lot of the audience, the first time seeing a lot of it in motion. Um, what do you think of sort of the adjustments they're making to the the stealth and the gameplay uh, combat-wise, because, you know, a lot has been made, as silly as it is, of them adding a jump button and the ability for Ellie to go prone and lie flat, but, like, the the contextuality of her stealth in the environment is a lot more advanced, I think, than what we've seen in the first game. Yeah, definitely. It definitely feels like a nice middle ground between the original Last of Us and something more outrageous like um, an Uncharted where you've got so much free reign, you know, Nathan Drake is so agile and and can sort of like move anywhere across the map. Um, I think it looks uh, incredibly versatile in terms, like she looks incredibly versatile in terms of um, how you choose to move her, uh, you know, there's Stealth is obviously still a massive option, but I love uh, that she can swing on these. What are they? What is she swinging on? Like she's like uh, a bot- in that. Yeah, she's swinging on a couple. I think like ropes or like yeah, uh, yeah, I, you know, like broken cable lines and stuff. Yeah, I, I I love that. I love I love that she can jump. I love that in the six years that uh, she has, you know, that that have occurred since the last game, she has learned to swim. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. um, they really drove that home in the you know the demo that she can actually swim now. No need to grab a raft for anyone. In yeah, time. no, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, and and obviously, it looks like they're putting you know a lot more emphasis into uh, uh, choosing your own play style in terms of like weaponry and how you want to pr- approach combat as well. Uh, you know, I love I love that that we have a, a broader tool set because in terms of it being kind of a stealth game, because like fundamentally, it seems like The Last of Us Part Two is still very much like you know let's avoid combat where we can because like combat is like messy and loud and that's not uh something you want to a messy loud thing isn't something you want to happen uh, in in that world have happened in that world um but it it really looks like there are so many options uh, in which to sort of approach any scenario um which i which i think is 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 fantastic for a stealth game that's exactly what you want you don't want to just be <clears throat> you know slowly slowly painfully making your way across an environment uh you want to have like tools at your disposal in order to um get from a to b in different ways you know and i just i like i love what i saw so far yeah it, it, the, the versatility the versatility of it seems to be a thing they're really pushing for um that it yeah, it, it was something I noticed in the demo that I got to play last year. Uh, that one had me facing off with dogs as well. There's a whole big uh, preview I wrote last year that you can check out on IGN. But that was that even further made it more of a like brutal scenario of um, you have more options, but so do the enemies in this game, it feels like, um, in what I played and what we saw. So it's, yeah, there's 
a lot of evolutions, I think, of the first game that we're seeing there. I, I was curious what you thought about the fact that as someone who, you know, obviously did really love the first game and does have a fondness for the characters and the storytelling of it all, this state of play didn't really, I think, say much about the story that they haven't said in other trailers or in interviews and things like that. Are you pretty much okay with where we have, you know, knowledge of the story at this point? Do you want to know any more? Do you have any concern about the story? Like, I mean, it's aside. Difficult. It's a difficult, yeah, a difficult thing to answer because, you know, full disclosure, I, you know, some, I, I think I mentioned it on a previous episode, but yeah, someone chose to jump into my Instagram and, and, and post some leaks there, which was, um, thanks fella. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for, for taking that big dump on my day. Um, but you know, like I, all things aside, uh, you know, earlier when we were recording with with Altano and with Max, uh, I, I'm going to steal one of Altano's points. But really, for me, it's all about the journey. It's not about, uh, you know, getting there. Sort of like sex, you know what I mean? Like you, you don't. It's not just about the end result. You've you've also got to enjoy the the, the, the journey. Um, I don't know why I made that a, a metaphor we didn't have on the first episode. I'll I'll let the audience know that. <laughs> But really, like any, you know, any pleasurable experience, you know, it's like just because, you know, the ending of Citizen Kane doesn't mean Citizen Kane is not an awesome film. Um, To use a really like wanky, hackneyed reference there. Um, But, you know, I'm I am I am so excited to go on this journey with these characters who I love. I definitely feel like we've been given enough top line information. I don't really want to know anymore. Um, Again, leaks aside. I, I, yeah, I, I think I, like, I, if they, if they revealed any more, I, I think it would be overkill. I think what we know is that there are enormous stakes. Um, there are, are, are enormous stakes just by virtue of this being The Last of Us Part Two, because we care so much about these characters, like, seeing them go through another ordeal, already the stakes are extremely high. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we know that, it, again, we we found out about these two uh, sort of factions or whatever you want to call them. And, of course, there are some new enemy types, uh, which look pretty awesome. Um, but, yeah, I, I think it, we know that the stakes are high and I don't, I don't really need any more information beyond that. Yeah, it, it's funny how there is a, like, meta level of stakes to this game because it is such a common sentiment of like oh i finished the last of us i didn't need a sequel but we have known that there is a sequel for a while now and we're getting to the point where it's like can the sequel i think live up to what many people consider to be one of the best stories in gaming ever and one of the best games you know of modern gaming Um, well it was it's it's interesting um dono because like i was one of those people that was very much like uh, we don't need a sequel. We don't need a sequel. It's perfect as it is. Let's not like run this thing into the ground. I don't want to see it become a franchise, you know. Uh, and I, I don't believe that it will head that way. I don't think Sony really operates in that way, um, especially with this with this type of storytelling. Um, yeah. Like if they wanted a populist thing that would sell well, Naughty Dog could just do Uncharted Five. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. If, if that were the impetus. Um, but yeah, like uh, originally I was very sort of anti it and the more I've seen of it uh, and the more I've heard uh, the, the leads talk about their approach to it, uh, I've, I've become really sold on it, obviously. And now the, you know, now it's less, I don't want this game to exist and it's more, I just, I am very scared for these characters and I almost <laughs> like, it's, it's going to hurt me watching them go through this or, you know, going on this journey along with them, but I'm very, you know, on board for the ride. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, of course, don't want to say anything more than what I've addressed from my last preview, so I will keep my thoughts on the state of play short other than to say, check out my review in a few weeks. But um, yeah, I I think they they did a really good job of showing off. Like you were saying, I think like as a presentation, this and the Ghost of Tsushima state of plays were really, really great. fill in for our standard like E3 presentations or PSX presentations like these are direct to the audience that really cares about this game or about PlayStation right. exclusives um they're formatted in a way that it doesn't feel like you're getting too little but they also don't feel like they've been giving too much in these um they're a really good balance and like I think we'll probably see state of plays that go back to the here's 15 games in 20 minutes but I do hope we see a balance of these going forward especially as we get into next gen and see you know, sequels to God of War and Horizon and Spider-Man probably, like, 
I think taking these like measured, focused approaches really let these games shine and speak for themselves and, and let the team speak for them as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I you know, I know, I know that d- devs and publishers can't always show so much um, of, of their games like way far out from, from release date. Um, I think this was a really perfect sort of segment to show this close to release date. Uh, like one of the things that I really also want to touch on is uh, in terms of like evolution from the first game is the, uh, the sort of behavior of uh, like the enemies, you know, the, the AI. Uh, there was that one moment where she grabs that guy and this is in gameplay and he says something like, hey, take it easy now, take it easy now. And, and you know, I'm sort of wondering, I was like immediately thinking what would, ha- what would have happened if she just sort of like kept holding on to him? You know, what, what would we have seen there? It's just, it, it, it gave a lot more life to, to um, you know, these faceless bad guys, I suppose, that didn't exist in, in the first game. And, and Jonathan, I know that you, uh, during your preview events, you were told that essentially AI are going to be more advanced, like that they're going to have relationships with one another and, you know, react if what, like one of their fellow cult leaders gets, you know, gets, uh, gets killed, they're going to react to that. Yeah, I, I spoke to Druckmann last, I guess it was September now, it feels like a decade ago. But uh, we we spoke about the AI and what really mattering, matters to them. And they even talked about that in that follow-up, like inside the details of The Last of Us video that launched also this week. They He really wanted to emphasize that like, yeah, you're going up against, you know, a group of five or six enemies, but those enemies have relationships to one another. They call each other by name. If, you know, let's say theoretically, maybe two of them are in a relationship, like you killed the woman and the man comes across her and he's like, she killed Jennifer quick. The body, like there's blood trailing this way, go. Like they they were giving examples of just, you know, they will react to you doing things. And I think they really wanted to emphasize that like, Yes, stealth games often have enemies, you know, like going in a set pattern, but your behavior will really trip up those patterns and cause them to adapt to your behavior, which is really cool, especially presumably when you think about like getting into longer scenarios and how that can play out. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that just goes back to that, uh, you know, that discussion we were having a little earlier about this uh, sort of video game protagonists being aware of mortality and being aware of what they're what they're doing and in turn like us being more aware of it you know like in instead of being nathan drake you know this is de- like this is definitely more like i feel like this is more me in this world you know rather than a than a a, a, a sort of a hot shot with a <laughs> you know with a with yeah. a shotgun yeah, it, it definitely, they've talked a lot about, I think, in these behind the scenes videos too, about they really want you to have to feel the impact of the, you know, choices the characters are making, um, especially when they're choices you're making when it comes to the combat and stuff like that. So yeah, I, I, I do love from what I saw from this demo and that preview, really the, um, the, as I think I was saying earlier, sort of the ability to both give you an evolution of the combat, but to also evolve what you're fighting against. Like this isn't a, you're outmatching them. Like this does really feel like there's a even playing field that's been created. Um, yeah, abs- absolutely. And extending that to the infected themselves, obviously there are some returning infected. We saw the clickers and the stalkers, but um, there's also the shamblers which a traditional big boy that explodes when you get really close kind of character design. But again, in that world, it's just made a little extra gross, you know, yeah. just a little extra like, oh, God, think of how that thing would smell. Uh, and then, you know, I really liked the little tease of the war of something unknown in, in, in the distance there. Uh, it, it just, you know, also serves to remind us that these games uh, – are very survival horror esque at at you know in their bones. It's all about sort of surviving against massive odds, and 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 they can be really terrifying. I'm like I am I am sort of waiting to just be hunched behind a, a car, you know, with the with the clicker kind of stalking me. Like I just love <laughs> that stuff, it, but it's so incredibly tense. And yeah, yeah, I love that they're kind of upping the stakes with with the the, the sort of the mutants as well, the mutant men. Yeah. <laughs> the stinky, mutant stinky, mutant, stinky mutant boys 
Uh, yeah. Um, as as beautiful as as the gameplay looks and um, everything, seeing more fidelity clickers, it, maybe not on the top of the list of things you want to see from you know graphical uh, fidelity. But I do want to say like the the gameplay preview and everything they showed, it, it definitely looks like they are pushing the PS4. Like this is definitely a like end of life cycle game. I think what we're seeing from the technical uh, side oh, of the game. Honestly, I'm I'm I reckon what's going to happen is end credits are going to roll and my playstation is just going to go up in flames and i'll be okay with that <laughs> yeah um how did she yeah. die playing vita how did the ps4 <laughs> die last of us part two yes exactly um but it, no it really does it looks stunning ghost of tsushima similarly it looks stunning um i do feel like these are very fitting kind of uh at least graphically, because obviously I can't speak to anything else, but uh, graphically, they, these do look like proper mic drops on this generation of consoles. Yeah, it, it gets me, you know, and a, this is a good transition into it, unless you have anything else on the Last of Us note, but um, it is a really exciting, like, yeah, PS5 is becoming a real thing. Like, we're theoretically six months out, probably, from the release, and we're going to start seeing those games. And yes, you know, we've talked about a lot on IGN uh, as a whole, and Tom had that great editorial. The initial jump is not going to be huge, but I do think we are going to see stuff from the first party side of stuff, especially as the years go on. That really is like, that is next gen. Like, that is really, you know, astounding to see. Um, so to see them pushing these consoles from these state of plays at the end of the life cycle, I can't wait to see what Naughty Dog and Sucker Punch and Santa Monica and everyone does on the PS5. Oh my god, it's just like, it, it's it's insane what they will be able to do now. It's sort of like, I, I'm just looking, I'm because, you know, we're working from home, I'm just looking at my like really tragic TV from 2010. I'm just like, oh god, <laughs> I've got to upgrade you, fella. Are you, are you going to upgrade before PS5, you think? I will have to, otherwise, what's the point, really? Yeah. yeah. So, Might as yeah, well just get definitely. a CRT at that point. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, um, but no, no, exactly. Like, the, the, it, it is very exciting uh, to see what they will do next. Uh, but it is hard to fathom the, the, anything looking better than, than this. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it'll be a very interesting progression to watch, but especially knowing what these studios have been able to do on both the PS3 and the PS4, I can't wait to see what comes in the PS5 generation. And speaking of that, I do want to touch briefly on, um, again, now that this show is even further delayed, there's even a higher chance that these rumors come true, but there have been a lot of reports and uh, speculation, but also some pretty well-sourced uh reports that there will be a PlayStation 5 event likely next week. Um, speculation from both Jason Trier, now at Bloomberg, and Jeff Grubb over at VentureBeat is placing it at June 3rd, I believe, is the uh, reported date. Sony has not officially commented, has not said this is officially in the works. We may find out the day before. Who knows? Like this Last of Us um, state of play came 48 hours beforehand. Nintendo often did directs 48 hours beforehand. So it wouldn't shock me if we find out Monday about an event Wednesday. Um, but I don't know about you, Lucy, but I know we were talking a little bit before the show, but it is, it is very weird and surreal to be like, we've been talking about when are they going to show stuff and giving them flack, you know, for being silent in the face of Xbox going, but it feels like we are finally on the cusp of seeing stuff and it, it's exciting to just think about that potential. Yeah, it really is. I mean, you know, I've always maintained that the sort of PS5 marketing rollout has just been really weird, just very odd. Uh, you know, I was sort of confident at the beginning that it was all going to, it was all underhand and it would all be rolled out in a much more uh, sort of sensical way, a way that made sense. Yeah. Convention- well, yeah, conventional is probably a better word for it, but like, uh, you know, it, it hasn't. And I think at this point, Sony really does need to kind of answer the big question that everyone has, which is, do I need to, am I going to be spending money on this thing at the end of the year? And a whole bunch of dry specs delivered by, by Mark Cerny uh, is fine. And a, a couple of JPEGs is fine. And, and the, the dual sense reveal was, was cool, but there's nothing, they haven't actually gone uh, even a little ways to answering that question. And I think that what we need to see now is, is gameplay. Uh, and I, obviously the box as well, because I think we've, we've sort of, it's been so opaque in our brains as to what a PlayStation 5 actually is. So it would be great to see its actual form. 
but more than anything, we need proper game, like gameplay and not, not, not just a, a gameplay demo, you know, because obviously I, I, acknowledging what was revealed a couple of weeks ago, but actual gameplay. And, um, and I really hope that whatever comes next is, is that. Yeah, I, I think we really need to see them say, especially after the flack that Microsoft got for their presentation that I, th- I am sure Sony took notice of, is very much like, we need to see gameplay, we need to see that these are games running on PS5, like that needs to be the little text at the bottom, or like, captured via PS5, like what, whatever they need to do, they need to really exemplify that this is what you're going to get when you invest X hundred dollars um, into this box in six months. Um, yeah. And uh, we talked about it a bit on the show last week when you were on, but also on the now uh, never airing episode for this week. But um, th- I think this is also as much as they should and need to show gameplay. This is also the one of the few times I think, as Brian says, legally where it's OK for them to show us logos and we'll be OK with that because it is not just telling you what you're buying into for the next six months, but what you're buying into for the next five, six years. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for me, that is, that is, I'm a okay with that. I do really want to see horizon zero dawn two, which in our last episode we did sort of, well, the, un, uh, in the, the long lost episode, we did <laughs> like admit that is like a, such a like profoundly stupid name for a, yeah. for a video game. And I, and I, I can't actually say it really with a straight face. Yeah, I'd say we were pretty close to having a good stand-up uh, segment of a comedy <laughs> album about the Horizon Zero Dawn sequel naming conventions that they're going to have to go with, because the options are Horizon Zero Dawn 2, which is silly, Horizon yeah. 1 Dawn, which is sillier, or like Horizon... Horizon 1 Dawn makes my skin want to like leave the building. But it, it, the thing is, it's you know so Horizon... Dumb. It, the thing to me is Horizon is going to be in the title. That word, yeah. without a doubt, is going to be there. Zero Dawn 2 is the most easy to say and the most like you instantly know what it is but it's also brand awareness right like they can't just dump that brand awareness out they still have to have it there i mean i suppose horizon is the i don't know but i i do think saying like horizon you know horizon one eclipse is a terrible name yeah like it'll be something it'll be something like that I, a funny thing that happened, and this was something we, um, obviously writing a lot of news stories, had a lot of style arguments about. At some point in the marketing of that game, they took out the colon. Right. Um, and so it used to be Horizon colon Zero Dawn, and then it just became Horizon Zero Dawn, which makes no difference, really. But th- there was obviously an intention of taking that out. So I have no idea what that game is going to be named. Um, I'm sure we will spend a good 15 minutes on it when it's officially revealed. But yeah, that that is a like top of mind. Gorilla's one of the main first party studios that we um, haven't heard from for probably the longest amount of time because that game came out early 2017. Um, and that that feels like one we... I, I wouldn't be shocked if we get a like cinematic teaser to either open or end the first showcase. Yeah, and I've you know I've banged on this drum for a long time, but I I don't want to see that as a launch game or anywhere close to that launch window uh, because I really want it to be singing on tech that's been pushed and probed for you know for for a good chunk of time uh, yeah. because you know it's it's such a gorgeous 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 world to to get lost in and and I want it to be as pretty as can be, uh, yeah. but I you know it would like just just. To, to sort of be told that it exists will go a long way. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where I even like today saw Kari Barlog uh, tweet, someone did fan art that, the, the, they did fan art for a God of War 2, a uh, God of War sequel, and their tweet just said, God of War Ragnarok is coming to PS5, and Kari quote tweets and is like, I've never heard of that. And it's one of those things where it's like, that studio probably has a God of War sequel somewhere in development, but they can't say that. Yeah. They can't just off the cuff mention. So these sorts of events, if that game is, you know, three, four years off, is a good place to announce that when they want to. But um, yeah, I, th- I think we need to see a mix of what we're going to get in the next, you know, like the launch window, and then also what we'll get two years from now wouldn't hurt. Yeah, um, 100% agree. I yeah. just want like I just want some momentum now more than anything. Yeah. You know, I want the train to start leaving the station because we've like all got pretty sick of looking at the station. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to see what the next station looks like. Um, yeah. The next PlayStation. 
Um, also because, um, as you were saying a little bit earlier on, I do want them to show the console either at this or very shortly, like within this event. Um, we had talked about this on the long forgotten show. The dual sense is such a visual departure from play, for like from the dual shock four and from the PS4, like we're used to very minimalist, uh, black, you know, boxes and controllers. And this is a two-toned paneled controller like it looks sci-fi like it looks yeah it looks like it's from futurama yeah and i I I feel i I want that for the whole console like i you know as i already mentioned i i kind of want this to be a little bit homer simpson's car you know i want it (laughs) to be a little bit stupid because that's funny and it's interesting and i like funny and interesting and you know the xbox series x is so the opposite of that. I mean, I think you know, the, the, I'm not ragging on that design. I think it's 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 it looks powerful, which I think is the message that it's meant to be sending across. It's doing a good job there. But like, I want the PlayStation Five to be like, whoa, you know, like whoa, yeah. what is what is this? Do press me and see. I just, <laughs> just I want it to be kind of, of yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just want, I want it to be kind of stupid and kind of ambitious, and I I, I like that. I like that in in, in technology. I I like that the dual sense kind of looked a bit that way, and yeah. I, I want it. I want it to stand out. You I know, don't want it has to be a black box. Exactly. I mean, like that's it happens with every reveal for Nintendo, but like the Switch and the Wii and the Wii Mote and the Switch Joy Cons. Like everyone always goes, "Oh, that's so silly at first, and then it becomes the most popular thing. Yeah. But the misstep that they had in between those was the Wii U, where the console was so insignificant. Like the look and the design of the console is one of the most forgettable console designs I think ever. Do you know um, what it? Uh, do you know what the Wii U looks? Have you seen Alien Resurrection? Uh, yes. Yeah. So you know how, like, at the end, Sigourney Weaver's like daughter Alien was kind of like part human, part xenomorph. Yeah. And it was just kind of like, ugh. Like it was just like a little bit like, ugh. Like, not super memorable, other than it had weird tits and it was meant to be an infant. <laughs> anyway, um, that was the Wii U. It just sure. wasn't really fully formed. It wasn't a xenomorph. It wasn't a human. It was just this weird kind of distasteful thing in between. Yeah, well, it's, yeah. It, it, I mean, to me, I'm almost now seeing, like, it's the top of the xenomorph's head if there was nothing else interesting attached to that dome. If it yes. just stopped there, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Mm. Um, it... And, and, you know, like the PS4 design, it's that layer cake design. It is a little more interesting than I think the PS3 design that, you know, got knocked as the George Foreman grill. But I I do think being a little audacious with the design, it still needs to be interesting and like look good because it's going to sit next to my TV for five or six years. But being a little ambitious with it, I think is a good thing. And I do think can go a long way, especially when you have to market that thing and put it in store shelves and on billboards and in TV commercials. It's cool to have something that's memorable. I agree. Bring on but, the um, Exactly. Uh, yeah, it'll be very interesting to see what we actually get. Obviously, if this event happens next week or a month from now, we'll be covering that on this show and on IGN. Uh, I'm going to largely wrap it up there. We'll have um, talk next week. We had Brian and Max go on a wonderful tirade about Man Eater. I'll get them to replicate that on next week's show. Um, but if you want to know more about Man Eater, they did a whole up at noon sponsored episode, but it was a really fun episode that was all shark themed. So you you should go check that out. Um, Also be sure to check out on IGN. I recently put up an interview with uh, Ryan Payton, who is the game director on Marvel's Iron Man VR. Um, That game just went gold actually in between us recording and us, the the two episodes that went gold, they announced. um, And we talked about sort of, the new gameplay stuff they've been talking about, the Iron Man suit design, some of the fun. He was telling me, um, you know, like a big wish fulfillment thing is obviously the controllers are Iron Man's gloves. And he was talking about uh, originally they have missiles that come out of the arm and to switch from the gloves to the missiles on the arm, you would press a button. And he joked and he was like, so many people on my team said, Ryan, that's stupid. You're Iron Man in VR. You should just move your arms like he would to shoot the missiles. And they're like, yeah, that makes sense. And so they changed the design to match that. And he's like, they really, really tried to emphasize how can we make every aspect of being Iron Man something you do in VR and not just a button click, because otherwise, why is it a VR game? Um, So we talked about that a lot. It was a really fun interview. He's a super great guy to talk to and easily could have talked for a while. We'll hopefully be able to talk to him again after that game comes out. Um, 
that's July 3rd. We have a very busy summer of PlayStation, even without this PS5 uh, reveal event if it happens. But of course, we will be covering everything. I do want to mention um, on IGN's Summer of Gaming, which kicks off, I believe, June 4th. Uh, we have a full schedule of events, uh, gameplay, exclusive reveals, and announcements. Obviously, the announcements are a secret for now, but we have a whole schedule that's up and being updated uh, constantly with new info on IGN and on our social feeds. So go check all that stuff out. We have just such an ambitious uh, amount of content going on, some great charity stuff going on in there. And also, Lucy, on the features team, uh, you've been putting together um, icons content. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So icons, uh, we've been theming months recently over at IGN and uh, June's month uh, theme is icons. So that's like iconic industry figures, iconic franchises. Uh, we've got a really cool list of people lined up uh, to interview for that. Um, I can't announce all of them right now, but the ones I can announce are John and Brenda Romero, uh, Brian Fargo, uh, Chris Avalon, and David Hayter, so Solid Snake himself. Um, awesome. we're, yeah, they're really, really fun interviews, um, and that we've got like big crunchy written pieces to accompany them as well. Uh, but those videos will be, uh, threaded through the summer of gaming live show. So check them out. Awesome. They're a lot of fun to put together. That's so great. I, I can't wait to see those. And we do have, yeah, there's so much awesome content and a lot of varied, really cool stuff. Dev interviews, gameplay reveals. Uh, really cool speed run stuff we have in the works. Uh, it, it's going to be a really, really fun month. And in the middle of it, The Last of Us comes out, you know, just in case we were bored. Uh, it, one of the biggest games of the year comes out too. So uh, June's going to be really fun. And of course, we'll be covering all the summer of gaming stuff. The PS5 event, if it happens, um, EA Play Live is happening this month. Uh, the Cyberpunk stream is happening, I think, the same day as EA because the world hates n- news writers at gaming websites right now i guess um it's it's a really really jam-packed month but i think it's gonna be a lot of fun um but i think otherwise that pretty much wraps us up for this episode uh part two the redo uh, of episode 647 uh lucy thank you so much for joining me for this episode it has been a delight um i did want to mention quickly before we go out of course summer of gaming but also uh if you use snapchat we now have been doing a weekly uh episode of beyond on snapchat is sort of a like three to four minute rundown uh maybe a little longer sometimes of the biggest playstation news uh so if you don't get tired of hearing my voice uh on this show for 50 minutes a week you can go check that out i believe it airs usually saturdays might be a sunday but it's on the weekends you can go check out that beyond themed edition of snapchat every weekend uh it's been a lot of fun to put together and the social team's been doing a really great job with those so definitely check that out um, but otherwise, huge thank you again to Lucy. Thank you to Max and Brian for being on the episode that didn't air. Uh, and thank you to our producer, Red, for having to deal with all of these technical issues, but also being willing to jump right back in and do this redo episode with us. We really appreciate it, Red. Um, but thank you so much for listening or watching. This uh, Beyond normally airs Wednesday at 3 p.m. Pacific at beyond.ign.com, youtube.com slash IGN Beyond, and your favorite podcast services around the world. If you're not subscribed to any of those, please subscribe because, you know, we're going to be having a lot of content soon to talk about. So definitely stay tuned for new episodes. But otherwise, thank you. Thank you so much for listening and are watching. We hope you're well. And as always, beyond. Beyond.